Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's a, it's a, real, a, a real treat to be here. Many of you <clears throat> know my work, but there's some of you from internationally um, who don't know me. So I always have to start off by having you look at your confirmatory bias that everybody here loves Scottish child psychiatrists from Hamilton, <laughs> right? And for some of our international colleagues, we had some great conversation over some, uh, over some um, Irish liquid um, uh, last evening. And, um, uh, and unlike many psychiatrists, I am, uh, uh, or unlike apparently, I am someone who believes that every behavior has a reason. And that when you uh, learn that I'm a psychiatrist, your uh, first questions don't have to be about medications because I am not of the school uh, that thinks that every little trouble can be resolved by taking a frickin' pill. Oh, now, uh, you guys, you guys, I have to let you know that I say frickin'. <laughs> All right, so uh, you can count how many times I do, and I'm going to try and, and, uh, and contain myself. So I am I, uh, I'm at an academic institution. Uh, I am a, a full professor now, but what I really am is a magpie. I love to steal shiny knowledge from the neuroscience and from uh, uh, youth justice and figure out ways to make it accessible, one to me and my way of thinking, but also so that I can share it. So what I'm going to be sharing with you this afternoon is the work of many people who have looked to see what is it that's going on in the adolescent brain. So I'm going to be telling you what goes on in the adolescent brain, and I'd love to hear from you guys if you've got questions at the end. Um, and then I want to loop it into the theme of the rest of our conference here, which is looking at youth justice, uh, looking at children, young people who do have challenges, uh, as well as looking at some of our indigenous populations. And I have to say I'm pretty proud to be in Ontario uh, with a government that is really looking seriously at research and seeing how can we make the services actually work uh, for young people. But I always start off, all my uh, presentations, I start off dedicating uh, to the teachers who have gone before me, who have formed me and, uh, and made me the person that I am. Uh, that's uh, the late Dr. Dan Offord and uh, Dr. Clyde Hertzman. Now, Dan is our, uh, is our leader in Canada in looking at how, how big an issue is children's mental health for our everyday, everyday kids. In 1984, he's the one who did the Ontario Child Health Survey. And that's where we found that one in five of our kids suffers a significant um, mental health problem. One in five. They're just repeating it now, 30 years later, and I think most of us in the world that I inhabit think that it's probably going to be bigger than that now, particularly when it comes to anxiety. But you know, the thing about Dan was he was passionate about the kids that I'm going to talk to you about. He was passionate about the casualty kids, the kids who, in the race, of life, instead of having a fantastic smooth pathway, had huge holes, had huge barriers that they had to overcome. It really got to him that your postal code, even in Canada today, can determine how long you'll live. Now, how we're different in Canada is that you can change your circumstances. But he believed that every single child, even the ones I'm going to talk about, have the right of full participation in community life. The other thing about being with Dan, though, is you felt felt. You felt a real sense of connection to him that, you know, I'll use, um, I'll use Dr. Tronic's words, not just that you had a relationship with him, but that there was a back and forth, a reciprocal, that you made meaning together. And so I have a dream, and many of you know it, and that is that every single child will have at least one adult whose eyes light up 
when they enter the room. And I think I'll modify that, that we'll have the adult's eyes light up and it begins the dialogue with that child, with that infant, that child, that youth, so that that meaning making happens. And then there's our man Clyde, who died much too early. But this comment of his, I want to have as the backbone of the entire talk. And that is that the brain is not fragile. I'm going to be talking about neuroplasticity. The brain is adaptive. It gets built by the environment that it is exposed to for a very good reason it adapts so that it will do well in that environment. So as I talk to you about some of the uh, challenging behaviors of young people in custody, if we can think as Dr. Tronic was just talking about at the end, that they have developed these behaviors and these strategies to survive in the world that they live in. And then the question becomes, well, how successful have they been? And then how can we help them rewire their brain to be successful in the society. So Clyde was one of our leaders in talking about epigenetics, how on top of the gene, we get little markers. But I always have to recognize, as we heard Dr. Bennett uh, recognize, that the lands that we stand on um, are of the, um, of the Mississauga New Credit, but that much of what we can learn from our First Nations people will help us through the troubling times that we're in. So we know from our First Nations people, and I learned from Tom Porter, that they have a philosophy to come back to. And that is that children are the sacred ones. They are the heart of the nation. It's the sacred responsibility of the community to raise our children. So if we as non-indigenous people can say, wow, that is an approach, that is a philosophy, that is a way of knowing that we have to embrace, our children will do far better. Even as uh, uh, mentioning about uh, indigenous culture, as Dr. Bennett did in um, uh, an immersion in that, there's so much profound knowledge in just the language. That ch the ch word for child means he who has the light within. He who has the light within. So as I'm gonna plant the seed here, that we need to think about our adolescents in a very, very different way. We heard uh, from, um, uh, from uh, Dr. Dolan about how across the world, uh, children are viewed, young people are viewed very differently. Well, unfortunately, in North America, our adolescents are looked on as being trouble, as not contributing very much, and is having very little intergenerational connection. When you talk about adolescence, if I'm doing a talk on adolescence, the room becomes packed because people are so worried about this period of time. So I want to say, I would like, if there's one uh, outcome from today's talk, it is that people approach adolescence with more empathy that as I talk to you about the brain being under construction in the adolescent period, that we think that maybe some of the things that our young people do are not done to drive us crazy, but in fact because there is growth going on in the brain and just as like we don't tell our little one who's learning how to walk, well, I showed you once, come on, I showed you once, we have to give our adolescents, more of our time, not less of our time. The other thing though we heard mentioned was the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Our First Nations people have believed that for a very long time. And that we have to be thinking about seven generations and the decisions we make now. Well, when I first heard that, I thought, well, what does that mean, <clears throat> intergenerational transmission of trauma? Because, you know, I'm a scientist at heart. And how could an experience of a grandmother or a great-grandmother, how could it be passed down? Maybe is it parenting practice? Well, 
the intergenerational transmission of trauma, the teaching of the elder, we are now seeing through the epigenetics that we heard about that yes, in fact, stress in the grandfather <clears throat> can in fact change the immune system and lead to more difficulties later in terms of asthma and eczema. Some of the studies that are coming out are absolutely fascinating. The wisdom of our elders. So as I tell you in a bit about how we, in, how, how the government in Ontario is using indigenous ways of knowing to help our indigenous youth who are in, in, uh, who are in uh, child cu in custody, um, how important it is that we come back and are grounded and have an empathetic approach and understanding. So why do we care about the brain? Well, because it is our master organ. It is who we are. Um, it is formed by experience, not by our genes. You know, we used to think that you got your genes, some from your mum, some from your dad. You know, you got intelligence genes, and if you were the first one, you got all the intelligence genes. And if you were number 11, I'm sorry, Pat, but you were kind of <laughs> done in. All the intelligence ones got used up. Sorry, I hate to be the one to break it to you. <laughs> but. <laughs> He's not going home, don't they? So, you know, but we used, to, we used to think that so much was determined by genes. Well, now we know that it's genes interacting with the environment. We heard that epigenetic and about the, uh, uh, the uh, serotonin transporter gene, and if you get long, long, or short, short, you're gonna be a dandelion, or you're gonna be an orchid. Well, we now know that it's the environment that builds, literally builds and sculpts the brain. But here's the $65 million question. If you didn't get it right in the early years, are you kind of screwed? Did anybody have that kind of wondering as uh, Dr. Tronic was, was talking? So here's the great answer. The answer is absolutely not. We know that we want to build the brain and the architecture of the brain as strongly as we can. We know that the brain is built by serve and return back and forth, not by fancy gadgets. But we also know that toxic stress makes a difference. But adolescence is an amazing time when we can, because of what we've learned from neuroscience, adolescence is another time when the brain is altering and changing so much, it is another opportunity to write the story. Write, W-R-I-T-E, write the story, as well as write, correct the story. And if we have a mindset an empathetic understanding of where of our young people in trouble come from. And we have a mindset that the brain is capable of change, particularly in these two periods, then we can change the life outcomes. But let's go a little bit deeper into what I mean by the brain of adolescence is under construction. So they're big, you guys are big like adults, but it doesn't mean that their brains are fully formed. Adolescence is not mini adulthood. They are not adults in waiting. It's a developmental stage. And here's the wonder. If you want a complex problem solved creatively, give it to those guys. Don't give it to us old farts who have tried stuff and said, no, that won't work. Uh-uh, no, that's not going to work. Give it to kids whose brains are under construction, who don't have those limitations of it won't work, who have got the excitement of trying over and over and over again to get it right. Let's hear what youth have to say. And as Pat said, let's make sure we act on what it is that youth have to say. So the science is telling us, oh yeah, it's an age of a heightened awareness of many, many things. We do know there's more injury and more problems in this period of time. But I think we also have to be asking, are we honoring our adolescents? to the full degree that we should be in North America. It's different in other countries. When my friend um, uh, from the Boys and Girls Club was talking um, at an asset building conference, the people from India came and said, you know, we don't have adolescents. 
We've got kids who are in their teens, but we don't have adolescents. You're describing a group of young people who are seen as a problem, who don't have any particular role in your society, and who have no intergenerational connectivity. To me, that says, wow, let's learn from the work that Pat and the, and the groups are doing to say, you know, when kids are given the chance, they flourish. But we have a bit of a mismatch. There's an evolutionary biologist called Dr. Peter Gluckman. I think he's from New Zealand, actually, Ian. Peter Gluckman. So he says that we used to have be the age between your first period and, have and getting married used to be biologically very close. So the biology and the sociology was well matched. But now you see how far apart they are? Now the onset of puberty is starting earlier and earlier, and first marriage, uh, first baby is 28, 29. So we've gone from a biological and psychosocial lineup to a huge big discrepancy, a mismatch. Is that making sense? What do we do with our kids? Rather than saying, well, what is it? What is it that makes for maximal growth well, what makes for ma maximal growth is having a sense of autonomy, having a sense of relatedness and connection, but is that what we are creating in our educational system? What gives you a whole sense of growth is what the Dr. Bennett uh, talked about, is um, uh, having engagement in meaningful uh, activities, like being outside, nature deficit disorder, surface learning, but do we have an educational system that is meeting that need. I'm happy to say in Ontario, we for sure are moving that way, but for a very long time, we've had kids who progressively in our educational system have become increasingly disengaged. So how do we know this? And keep in mind that I'm trying to balance here for you the, the complex development in the brain that says that the adolescent brain is immature in its decision making with the other bodies of research that say this is a magnificent time for creativity and change. So the biology tells us, the blue of the brain here that you see is showing us that the, um, uh, the, the, the brain is undergoing change. Now here's the big thing. We thought that because a baby's head by about three was adult size-ish, just about, that's why we don't deliver toddler brains, we, develop, we deliver one-year-old brains, right? You know, a one-year-old, a three-year-old deliver don't deliver, right? So we thought that because at three, the brain that was the size of an adult brain just about, that there wasn't that much big, big change. Learning happened. And then Jay Geed and others from the National Institute of Health started serially um, uh, scanning, doing fMRIs on the same kids and saw, wow, there is all kinds of sculpting and remodeling that is happening in the adolescent brain that wasn't known about when I went to medical school. It's only been in the past 10 to 15 years. So what we know now is that the last areas to develop are here in the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is our executive director. The last area to develop is the executive director. That is the planning, judging, organizing, impulse control, emotion regulation, last to develop. The teen brain, adolescent brain is under construction. So kids aren't trying to drive us crazy by forgetting them, their stuff all the time. Under construction, their biological drive is to be with their peers. Now it doesn't mean because they want to attach to their peers that they're no longer attached to their parents. Big myth. The lovely joy of the attachment system is it gets to expand. So you're attached to your parents even as you're attaching to your peer group. North America gives us a very, very different message than that. 
So we know adolescence is a period of heightened brain plasticity. Brain plasticity meaning, meaning that the brain cells, the neurons, and the synapses, guys, as new experiences come in, the brain gets molded by that. So the more the system gets used, the more it gets strengthened up. And you guys are all Roots of Empathy people and you know this really well. But what's happening is sculpting. What young people are busy doing is sculpting their brain. So forecasting what's coming later. If young people are in a custody facility that believes that kids are in there to be punished and they are treated poorly and people aren't thinking about what their skills are, that is sculpting their brain. If they're in a custody facility that says, you know, we believe in rehabilitation we believe in reintegration back into the community. So what we are going to be doing is relationship custody, where we are going to see how our relationship and our mentoring with the young people can change their trajectory. That's relational custody, that's brain plasticity. Make sense? How the attitude and mindset makes such a difference. So the brain maturation it happens over a larger period of time. But here's the thing, it doesn't all happen at once. So there are different systems at place at different times. Big areas I'm going to talk about are the prefrontal cortex, the executive director, but also the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is a wondrous system. It's our emotional system. It's our, I want it, I want it now, I'm enjoying this, I want it, I'm enjoying this. That didn't work out so well. Oh, but I still want it, I still want to go for it. So, when we look at a picture, like, let me just get this picture here. When we look at a picture of a kid doing something like this, we as adults say, uh-oh, uh-oh, does he know that this is dangerous? Yes, he does, of course he does. Adolescents are very bright. They're just as smart as we are. Does he know that it's dangerous? Yes, he does. But why is he doing that, knowing that it's dangerous? What is he seeking? Not safety, but thrill. Right, so the hyper-rationalization going on in adolescence is thought to be attributable to the dopamine, the reward systems that are in their brain. So they have uh, incentives, the brain, the way the, work, the brain is working, they've got incentives to go after thrills. We have dull incentives to stay safe. Let's have no frickin' risk. That's what happens. You know, so enjoy it, guys, because it gets dull from here. No, only kidding. <laughs> only kidding. I didn't say that really. I didn't say that really. But so the limbic system, the limbic system is under development. That's the dopamine that's deep within the brain. So we've got the, the experience of bigger highs and lower lows. This is natural development. They're especially sensitive to emotional cues. You show an adolescent, on average, this is the work of Dr. Jurgen and Todd, you show an adolescent a picture like this, and what they see, well, what do we see as, as adults mainly? What do, emotion do we see? Fear, right? So she showed a bunch of adolescents this picture, and they said, oh, she looks surprised, she looks angry, she looks annoyed. And she went, wow, that's pretty interesting. Let's show them some more faces. And what she found was that the processing of emotion is under construction in the adolescent brain. And that in fact, where emotion is being processed very often is in the amygdala. That fight, flight, or freeze, and those areas of the brain that are responsible for quick judgments, being safe, being on guard. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things that it means is that more emotion, there's a bit of a communication gap. There's more emotion being read than we think we're emitting. Any of you had your kids say to you, why are you yelling so much? And you want to say, you want to talk about yelling? You ain't heard nothing yet, right? So picking up more emotion. Now, does that mean that we have to go around with Botox-like faces? 
you know, like not at all. But we have to be aware that the processing that's going on is very different. So the prefrontal cortex is under construction. So here you've got this fast car. I want thrills, I want sensations, and that's driving when you don't have the brake of the prefrontal cortex. I was once driving to Toronto to give a talk on the adolescent brain to the YMCA, and it's stop and go, I'm in Hamilton, which is about uh, an hour from, well, it's an hour from here unless you're um, in usual daytime and it's six hours by car, but it was stop and go, stop and go, stop and go, and then we've got a big period of time driving, and then to stop and go, and I look in my rear view mirror, and I can just see on the face of the young person behind me that they've put their foot on the accelerator, not the brake. So boom, smuck right into me, right? So I get out of the car and what's the first thing I think? Under construction. <laughs> Under construction with perhaps a few F-bombs involved as well. But what's this guy worried about? The first thing he's worried about is what? My mother's going to kill me, right? <laughs> No, your mother's going to be so happy that you're not dead. But so what we see then is a drive, a drive for thrill without the brain of the stop plan and think about it. Okay, so the brain is also a very much a social brain. Um, and here we have uh, an example of the social, the social brain. Now, I usually just so show this picture, but I hung out last night with Dr. Lamy, who's this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sports guy. So the background of this picture, if I've got it right, is this is Michael Owen, who, who played for Liverpool, and he's just missed an amazing shot. So here we go. The mirror system goes Everybody puts their hand on their head. Unless, of course, they've all gone to the class that says, when Michael Owen misses a goal, this is what you do, right? And they practice for 10 minutes beforehand, right? So no, if you're a red shirt, you've got great empathy for that guy. But if you're a yellow shirt, it's quite different, isn't it? Look at these guys, hey, hey, yeah, you missed it. Yeah, go, whoever they're playing. So, risk taking, risk taking, gets worse when you're with your peers. Why? They've biologically looked at this and it's very clear, even if you're in an MRI machine and you're playing a game where you have to stop at a stoplight, just hearing that your friends are watching you has you have more crashes. So there's something about being with your peers that increases risk taking. So we have this balancing act between do it now and stop and think about it. So that's the teenage brain under construction. So that's what we've got, right? So what we think affects how we feel affects how we act. We in North America, I say, too many people think, adolescents, oh my lord, there's an alien comes in, I just have to get through it, they won't talk to me, they won't treat me respectfully. How we feel is powerless and how we act is we do dumb things like because they're young and we know they're going to drink, we buy them the, uh, uh, the uh, 24 pack of beer so they'll drink it at home at 14 and 15 instead of going out. We want to be their friend and have them at, safe at home. Completely wrong. But what if we think that adolescence is a time of great opportunity? It's a time when kids can learn, when we can learn from them. If we think that there are great possibilities in this time, we know that once adolescents volunteer, it's hard to get rid of them. When they're volunteering in things that they love to do, my friend from the Boys and Girls Club in Ontario, you need to do 40 hours. They have a crisis. They can't get rid of the frickin' kids. They love it. They love it. Where is that in the newspapers? Where is that in the newspapers? So what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. Now let's shift gears a bit now, because I would like that empathic response that I'm hoping that we see more in this revolution for our adolescents is also applicable to our most vulnerable, 
to our most vulnerable adolescents who end up because of many things that happened in their past over which they had no control, have ended up without the skills or without the brain development in the ways I've been talking about it and end up in custody. Or they end up in child welfare and then end up in custody. So in Ontario, I'm very happy to be sharing the work of uh, three, uh, three women as part of a team, uh, Trish and Donna and Lauren, if you just want to shake, uh, shake, yeah, shake your hands out there. So the Ministry of Children and Youth Services in Ontario are in 2003, the Youth Criminal Justice Act got changed. It went from the Young Offenders Act to the Youth Criminal Justice Act. And it said that you need to be thinking about adolescence as a different, well, this is what I read in it, a different developmental stage, and that we have to be thinking about um, reintegration and rehabilitation. So the ministry changed dramatically over the decade. They moved it and then they became part of the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. So when the YCJA first came in, all the options were custody or probation. They invested 28, 29 million dollars based on research and said, how are we going to do this differently? One, because it wasn't working, and two, because it did not make any sense. When you lock kids up, they do worse. They just become better criminals. They have to come back over and over again. So what they moved to uh, was a spectrum of services. Let's keep kids out of jail. Let's have them engaged in activities in the community where they can do some good and develop the skills that they never had. So there's a big push on prevention, diversion, other community programs, reintegration. Now, when the legislation came in in uh, 2004, I think what they had hoped for was a reduction in uh, deten a reduction of 30% and now there's a reduction in 80%. In detention itself, there's been a, a massive reduction. So they've gone to the, that very limited view to a whole spectrum where there are more than 400 evidence-informed programs, there are 200 community partnerships, and there's 60 custody and detention. So in Ontario, almost nine out of every 10 youth are served and receiving community-based programming. There's even this craziness that some kids are volunteering to go on probation. There's about 250 kids, I was it, that, uh, that Trish, on the phone who have volunteered to go on probation because they're recognizing when you're on probation, you have people who have been trained in relationship custody, who believe in mentoring, who believe that you have strengths that you bring to your life, that you may have some skills that you are in need of, not that you're bad kids. And so kids are actually asking their, uh, at least one kid has asked their probation officer, listen, are you gonna be around and go into the adult system? Because I'm gonna need you then too almost got the message so here we've got here here we've got so you can see a very very different shift so what does this mean and the first time i heard relationship custody and i'm proud to say that i've been part of the uh, uh part of the education so we're really truly talking about relationship custody so a philosophy that encourages and empowers staff at all levels of the organization to foster a positive and professional relationship with youth in their care. I'm adding in the neuroscience that this makes a heck of a lot of difference. I'm adding in from what we're learning in terms of how the young people are finding that their skills are increasing. They're finding that their skills are increasing, that their engagement with supports is increasing, that this is a system that works. And I say is rewiring their brain. It's rewiring their brain. So the government, in its wisdom, actually looked to see, well, this is a great idea, but can we get some evidence to back it up? And so what they did was they did a complete literature review. So then, if you look at this, you see what are the skills and characteristics of the people? Empathy, genuineness, sincerity. 
So this is talking about our empathetic brain, and I would say the energy that Dr. Tronic was referring to hesitantly, bringing it in. I was in McLean's magazine in August uh, um, with just one tiny little quote, but you know, I was in McLean's magazine in August, and, um, and it was talking about solitary confinement. And the differences with the same type of offenders in different institutions is stark. There are institutions who have got the same level of offenders who do not use solitary confinement, or very rarely, or if they do, um, they have very few critical incidents, and when they've had a relational focus, when they're basing their in information and their interaction on the inter in the strengths and mentoring and thinking, how can we reintegrate, rehabilitate, rather than punish and teach the little whatever you want, then there's a massive difference. We can make a difference for our most vulnerable. But you see how empathy, empathy both for adolescents, empathy in the, on the part of the people who are working with the, young, uh, with the young. So let me just bring in the third part of things I said. Is, uh, we had this wonderful conversation, Mary and I on the phone, and then Mary and, uh, um, and Karen and Ian and I, and I said, I'd love to bring in what I'm also hearing about what's happening with our indigenous um, uh, young people. So uh, again, the ministry had identified, we have uh, many, many Aboriginal young people who are in jail. They are 36% of Ontario's um, uh, youth population you see are in that far north, that northwestern Ontario. But when you look at the in custody and in jail statistics, you see that they're 3.4% of Ontario's youth population, but they're almost 10% of the admissions. So this tells us there's something going on. There's something going on. There's something going on that's not going to be that's not going to be fixed just by one program. It's not going to be fixed just by um, just as Atawapiskat is not going to be that's one of our First Nations communities where there's an epidemic of suicide. It's not going to be fixed just by sending in mental health workers. Well, you're going to have to feed the kids if they're hungry. That does make you feel a little um, uh, stressed out. But so this approach that I'm going to describe to you is part of an approach that I see it could be very, very helpful for our Indigenous youth. So what they're working to do is improve the outcomes for Aboriginal uh, youth. So prevention, early intervention, as well as treatment. Prevention, not just waiting until the kids are in trouble, but seeing what can we do beforehand. So uh, Patanjikum and Atawapiskat don't have a place for youth to hang out in. Imagine that. They don't have drinkable water either. Hello, Canada. Hello, Ontario. But they don't have a place to hang out. So what do you do if you're a young person who, what's the point in getting up in the morning? You're not going to get up in the morning and be excited about your life if there's nowhere for you to go and the highlight is sniffing glue. So as a province, as the holders and thinking of the sacred ones, the government in this initiative has really thought through what are the needs of the young people. So prevention. In a number of the communities, and one of them being Patanjikum, they have um, paired up with the right to play. And a whole group of uh, professional lacrosse players went in had a bunch of the kids join up and learn all about lacrosse. Not only that, but they got some dollars from some patch together from some um, a construction company and said, you guys, the dock doesn't work. How about we build, a, we have a summer employment program. They hired 25 different uh, kids to build the dock to build playground equipment. And what the ministry said was, we will deal with the crap of government 
and you as the community make it happen. Because you know, this is our Ministry of Children and Youth Services. Some of these dollars have to come from this guy, and this one has to come from this guy, and this one has to come from this guy. And the guys, Joanne Miller and Daryl Sturtevant, the ADM said, we're gonna deal with the crap. You deal with what you need to do to make our, uh, the, the kids safer. So what kind of results have they had? Um, they've uh, involved in these diversion and the whole range of things, over 2,500 youth. Between 2003 and 2014, they've decreased detention by 33%, and they have decreased custody by 61%. They are using the teachings of the elders the seven teachings of the elders. The elders are involved in the programs. They are the chiefs and council were part of the decision making about where and when. The kids are developing a strong sense of their identity as Ojibwe young men and women. They are, their brains are being very different biologically wired in ways that um, are, are showing amazing effect. So culturally informed ways, they have centers which are in where the kids are. They have youth centers as well as they have treatment centers that are completely embedded and infused with First Nations teachings, which has to do with traditional healing, reparation, connecting with the elders, as well as traditional teachings. So these are very exciting things to be learning about. We'll hear more about what's happening in some of the, um, uh, in some of the other countries from, uh, from Scotland and New Zealand. But I think it's important for us to know that when we deal with our young people through the, the lens of empathy, when we help them make meaning of their life in different mentorships and relationships, then hugely different outcomes can happen. Our Cree people say that our elders have lots to teach us. And when we see uh, teachers, uh, the elders talking, one of the famous stories is, you know, life is hard. The elder is talking, saying life is really hard. We've got a battle going on in us all the time. There's good in us and there's bad in us. There's evil in us and there's love in us. And the elder is talking to the kids and he says, you know, it's like we've got two wolves battling. And one of the little ones up front says, well, Grandfather, tell me which one wins. And he says it depends which one you feed the most. I'm hoping that I've given you some materials here that you can think of our adolescents with more empathy, that you can think about some of the things that are happening for our most, most distressed and deserving young people and hope that what we're feeding them comes from that empathic heart that beats in all of us if we only let it free. So I'm going to say thank you guys. You've been amazingly attentive and I'm going to stop and we have time for questions and I'm not in trouble. Yes. Okay. Thank you.